So I had Lyme disease and um, between the treatments and the frustrations I had, that really became a, like a serious toll on me and I became bitter and I became angry and I became so obsessed with healing that it was crushing me. Um, and eventually I hit this point where I just gave it up to God and whether I was healed or not was his thing because I can't control it anymore. And there was such a freedom and a liberty in that. Um, but I would say after truly relinquishing control, um, there just became this like habit of surrender in my daily life because now that I've surrendered the thing that meant the absolute most to me of healing, I was like, I could surrender like my, like not only my entire life, but just my everyday life. Um, and, and in a fun way, still being sick, I guess fun isn't the right word, but in an interesting way, still being sick, just continued to establish that reliance on him because on a bad day, I was not gonna be the one getting me through that. Um, and so I kind of just assumed that I was gonna be sick and this is the life I'm gonna live. And in terms of like my family and things like that, I just assume that I'm gonna be sick and I'm just gonna have to live within those boundaries and within those confines. Um, but eventually I did start to see some new doctors um, to just kind of see where I'm at now. And that was a few months ago, it was about six months ago. And um, in November the 23rd, um, I got back all my tests and every single Lyme disease test came back negative. And not only did they come back negative, they came up undetectable. And like, that was never supposed to, <laughs> that was never supposed to happen. Um, every doctor I ever had told me that this is something you're just gonna live with the rest of your life. You can um, modify it, you can um, optimize how you live with it, but you're never getting rid of it. And um, even now, like, <laughs> God's a God of miracles, and um, he removes some, like, to think of that miracle just, like, blows my mind, but to think of, like, the growth from the pain and the suffering, like, that was the miracle. Like, the miracle in taking away the Lyme disease was something, and that was um, the greatest gift, truly, like, the greatest gift I could ever receive. But the biggest miracle was how he changed my heart. Like, I know that sounds like a movie, but it's true. Like, when I think about, like, the pride I had and the, um, like, self-reliance I had and, and the insecurities I have, and when I think about the way he just had to break me down until I felt like a little tiny pebble until he could build me back up again in him, like, I wouldn't change my deepest suffering for that because, like, yeah, I just... That was a true miracle. So November 23rd um, is probably my favorite day of the year now. Um, it's also near Thanksgiving, so that's good too. But um, I mean, that's the day that the God of miracles just did, did what he does best. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Missy's story, I tell you, it's been awesome. Uh, I got to marry she and her husband in the middle of all of the journey that she was going through. And so these are, these are the kinds of miracles that we hear about all the time that people don't believe happen every day. And we got a chance to experience it and journey with Missy. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joe McGinnis. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm on the preaching team. It's my privilege to, uh, to be up here today. And we are in week four of our series of Esther, where we, over the last three weeks, we've looked at different things, uh, such as we've looked at the fact that sometimes the, the obstacles that come up in your life turn out to be your greatest opportunities. We looked at the fact that God is present in your life, even when his presence isn't plain from time to time. And ultimately, that God has a good plan for you and me. Not only that, but we had the chance to walk with Missy in her journey and see how it kind of parallels this story of Esther because Missy, there was obstacles to opportunity. There was uh, God's presence and God's plan. Those are all prevalent in her story as well. And so as you go in today, I want you, if there's one thing that you're going to get from today, one thing that you can pull out from everything we've been talking about, it's this. It's the secret to surrender. And here's the secret to surrender. Surrender holds the power to turn your sorrow into celebration. Surrender holds the power to turn your sorrows into celebration. 
Surrender is to defined as, as a, um, to cease resisting or to give up, to submit to authority. And so let's look at the, the book and the story of Esther one last time here as we trace this idea of surrender throughout the story of Esther. I want to go through the entire story of Esther really quickly. So while you go through the pages, starting there in chapter 1, I'm going to kind of just tell the story here. As we start off, we find out, we, we see this young gal named Hadassah, who we know of the, the, uh, uh, the Persian name Esther. And she's this young gal who gets taken into slavery as a sex slave into the harem of the king. Um, and, and she gets taken away. We get introduced to her cousin Mordecai, who's this great guy who's trying to help her the best way that he knows how. And he, so he tells her, he says, Esther, as you, as you go, keep quiet about the fact that you're Jewish. Don't tell the king. Don't tell the people. And all of a sudden, Esther then finds favor in the king, and she is made queen of all of Persia. About the time that she's made queen, we get introduced to um, the villain of the story. His name is Haman. And Haman is just an all-around bad guy. He's, he's this uh, descendant of the Canaanites, and, and, uh, and he's, just, he's just a bad guy. As a matter of fact, one day it says he was walking down the road, and he's, uh, he's the king's right-hand man. And as he's walking down the road, as, as true to form what they need to do, people are bowing to him as he's walking by. He goes by this guy Mordecai. Mordecai stops, does not bow. And it says that in that moment that the anger inside of him is just raging. Not only for, uh, for Mordecai, is he mad about Mordecai, but it's actually to all of the Jews. And he, deci- he, he decides he's going to wipe out all the Jews in the Persian Empire. And he creates this plan and gets the king to sign an edict saying that all of the Jews were going to be wiped out. And then it says that, that he went, it says, actually says he went home and, and he, he cast lots, or he says that, like he rolled the dice. It's called the pur, P-U-R. The pur. It says that he rolled the pur to, des- to decide what day, what month, all of the Jews in the Persian Empire were going to be killed. Here's what it says in Esther chapter 3, verse 7. In the twelfth year of King Xerxes, in the first month, the month of Nisan, the pur that is the lot, was cast in the presence of Haman to select the day and the month. And the lot fell on the twelfth month of the month of Adar. Now this meant that, that there's now a time restraint. In 11 months from now, all of the Jews in the Persian Empire were going to be wiped out by Haman's men. And so Esther and Mordecai, they're starting to feel that pressure, and they come up with this plan. And we, we talked about that last week. That was that moment that we said Esther was made for, right? This is for such a time as this moment, where she comes into the presence of the king, and the king is right there, and as she comes into the presence, who knows what's going to happen, because you just don't do that. But the king grants favor. Let's Esther come to him. She comes up, and he, she's like, what, what do you need, Esther? Whatever you want. Half the kingdom is yours. What do you want? And she created this plan. She said, well, let's do this. How about tomorrow night uh, we have a a meal, and you come to the meal? Matter of fact, bring Haman with you. Now, the idea is going to be this. We're going to get the king there. He's going to have a lot to eat. We're going to give the king a lot to drink as well. You guys remember we told the story of this. The king's kind of got a little bit of a drinking problem. And once he has plenty to drink, we're going to then drop the bomb that I'm Jewish and that Haman's trying to kill all the Jews, and we'll see how this works out. And so the day comes. The king comes uh, with Haman, they, they, they come, they sit down, they have the meal, and right in the middle of the meal, the king turns to Esther and says, okay, so what's going on? What do you need? What, what is it? Half of my kingdom is yours if you want it right now. And she chickened out right there. Have you ever had that moment where, like, you know, like, like what you're about to say is kind of a make or break moment, especially, like, it depends on how the other person is feeling in that moment? I had that when I, I asked my father-in-law for permission to marry my wife, Amy. I show up, and I had it all planned out. I don't know, guys, if you've done this, but, like, I had it all planned out in my head. You know, I was going to tell him uh, how I was going to make all this money, which worked out really well, right? I was going to make all the money to be able to do it. We're going to live here. This is, I, all the things was all planned. I had my script ready to go, and I show up to the house, and they're all watching a movie. And guess what the movie is? Father of the Bride. <laughs> guess who chickened out? I had to ask him a couple days later, right? Because I knew it all depends on his mood, and that was not a really good time to be doing that. Esther's in that moment with the king, and and he's like, what is it? And she's like, how about you come back to another meal? And and bring Haman too, and I will answer you at that time. 
And so they, they leave, and it says that Haman walks away, and he's feeling good about himself. I mean, Haman walks with the king, talks like the king. He's got the authority. He's got all of this. The queen is even asking him over for dinner. The queen even likes him. This is, things are going great for Haman. It says until he walks by the gate and he sees Mordecai. As he sees Mordecai, in that instant, all the anger comes back and all the hatred. It says he comes home and he's talking to his wife and his family and he's just complaining about Mordecai and the Jews and how, how much he just loathes them. And they, they give him an idea. Here's what he says in Esther chapter 5, verse 14. They said, have a pole set up reaching as high as, as 50 cubits. Now that's about 75 feet in the air. Ask in the morning if, if Mordecai could be impaled on that stake. And then go to the king, with the, go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. It says the suggestion delighted Haman. And so he had the pole set up ready to go. Now this is one of my favorite parts because it says while this is going on, the king goes back to the, to the palace and he's laying down and he's trying to fall asleep and he can't fall asleep. And so he, he's like, okay, he calls for the scribes. He wants the scribes to come and he's like, you guys need to read me like the last staff meeting mo- minutes, right? Read me the minutes of what's been going on in the, the kingdom. And so he's laying there and the scribes are there and they're going through the things that have happened over the last weeks and months and going through all of this, knowing that it's going to knock him right out. And all of a sudden, they read about this guy who actually saved the king's life. It happened, uh, he, he found a plot, he discovered it, and it saved his life. And the king remembered it, and he says, I never did anything to, to honor this guy. Well, guess who the guy is, right? The guy is Mordecai. And the king's like, I've never done anything to honor him. I have to do something. What should I do? I mean, and so he gets up the next morning, and here's the scene. He's walking down, he's in the palace, and as he's walking down, he's trying to think of what to do, and Haman is making a beeline, because Haman's like, I'm going to talk to the king, we're going to get Mordecai killed, and then I'm going to be able to enjoy my day today. So Haman comes walking right up to the king, he gets right there, and the king goes, hold on a second, wait a second. hey, I've got, I've got someone in the kingdom that I want to honor. You know, how, how would you honor somebody who's done a great service to the king? Who's done a great service to the kingdom? What would you do? And Haman knows exactly who he's talking about, right? Haman's like, he's talking about me. And so here's what he says in, in Esther chapter 6, verse 7. He says, well, for the man that the king delights to honor, have him bring a royal robe that the king has worn. And a horse that the king has written, one with the royal crest placed on his head. Let the robe and the horse be entrusted to one of the king's most noble princes. Let them robe the man that the king delights to honor. Let him lead him on a horse throughout the city streets, proclaiming before him that this is what's done for the man that delights that the king delights to honor. Now, if you haven't learned this in your own life, God is a God of irony, right? In that moment, the king is like, that is a fantastic idea. Ah, uh, this is great. Uh, uh, Haman, 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 you, and Haman's like, yeah, yeah, because you yeah, do all of that to Mordecai. Now you can imagine what's going on in Haman's mind. Like his head explodes at this point. All that anger, all that hatred, and he's just going crazy inside. And so when he gets to the to the banquet that night for the second meal. He's had a really bad day up to that point. And they get to the banquet, and they sit down, and all the people are there, and the king is there, and Haman's there, and Esther's and uh, halfway through the meal, the king turns, and he's like, Esther, what is it that you want? Now tell me, what is it? Half my kingdom's yours. And here's what she says. In that moment, she takes a brief, deep breath. In chapter 7, verse 3, she says, if, you, if I have found favor with you, Your majesty, if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. Spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold, have been destroyed, uh, sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. And she goes on and she says that at the heart of the, the plot, the heart of all of this, is this guy Haman. And the king goes nuts. The king goes so crazy, it says that he took Haman and actually impales Haman on that pole that was made for Mordecai. Now this gets crazy because not only that, but later on it says that he actually had all of his sons impaled as well and family. 
Not only that, the, but the king decrees. He says, okay, so when Haman's men comes to attack there on that, that time in the month of, the Ad- of, of Adar, um, the, the Jews, you guys fight back. And when it's all said and done and the dust is all cleared, it says well over 75,000 of Haman's men are dead and the Jews are saved. And in that moment, Mordecai, Esther, and the rest of the Jews celebrate. Here's what it says, Esther 9.20. It says, Mordecai recorded these events. And he sent letters to all the Jews throughout the province of King Xerxes, far, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and the 15th days of the month of Adar as the time in which the Jews got relief from their enemies, as the month in which their sorrows was turned to joy and the morning to a day of celebration. Not only that, but they called uh, the celebration Purim. It says that the enemy of the Jews had plotted against the Jews to destroy them, that he casted the pur, which is the lot, for their ruin and destruction. Verse 26, therefore these days were called Purim, from the word pur. Verse 28, it says, These days should be remembered and observed in every generation by every family in every province in every city. These are the days of Purim. Should never fail to be celebrated by the Jews, nor should the memory of these days die out among the descendants. And guess what? They haven't. It's continued on from generation to generation, this celebration of, of Purim, which was actually just celebrated on February 24th and 25th, just a few couple weeks ago. I was talking to a friend of, of ours who's, uh, who's Jewish, and we were talking about Christmas and Hanukkah, and, uh, and, and he said in, in his family growing up, Hanukkah really wasn't that big of a deal. It was actually Purim is the big deal. That's where they exchange the gifts because you see the celebration of Purim, th- that is where it's a, it, it's a celebration of deliverance and of salvation. And I love what we see here. The, the very instrument of destruction is used as a, as a way to re- remind the people of God's faithfulness. The story of Esther is an unbelievable story. As I dug into the story of Esther, it really is unbelievable. There's actually, people have been debating it for hundreds and hundreds of years on the historical accuracy of the story of Esther. And mainly because the story of Esther has every element of a really good story, right? You've got the, the beautiful heroine, You've got the, uh, the Obi-Wan Kenobi-like figure who's the, the wise mentor. You've got this king who's all-powerful. You've got the evil villain who's out for plotting the destruction of, of everybody uh, who is good. You've got that one moment, which is like that moment of truth, that moment when it all rides on this. At the very end, you see it all start to unravel for the bad guy, and at the very end, he gets all the stuff that he was planning for everybody else. It's totally unbelievable. And yet, the story has gone from generation to generation to generation. How is that? Well, it's easy. Because the story of Esther, this is a story of God. It's a story of God's faithfulness. It's a story that we see time and time again. We see it when we see Lazarus being raised from the dead because God is faithful. We see it in the story of this guy named Simon who becomes Peter the rock and the, 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 the disciple of Jesus who, who, because of God's faithfulness. We see this with the Apostle Paul who is a murderer, who, who's an anti-Christian. He just hates everything and becomes the Apostle Paul because God is faithful. It's a story that we see all the way back in Genesis from that moment when Adam and Eve walk away from God and God pursues his people all the way to an empty grave. Because God is faithful. Psalm 33 says, For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his ways is done in faithfulness. 2 Thessalonians 3, 3 says, The Lord is faithful. Who will establish you and guard you from the evil one? Psalm 119, 90 says, Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You've established the earth, and it stands fast. The Apostle Paul reminds us in in Romans 8, it says, For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things in the future, nor powers, nor heights, nor depths, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. God is faithful. Hear me today. When we surrender 
to a faithful God like that. That kind of surrender has the power to turn sorrow into celebration. So for the remaining few minutes that we've got, I want to answer a simple question. How do you surrender your sorrow? Because we all have it. How do you surrender your sorrow? Well, first, you surrender your sorrow when you surrender your present circumstance. You can surrender your sorrow when you surrender your present circumstance. Esther came to this moment where she had to just completely give up. Right, she had to completely surrender and turn it over all, all over to God. There was nothing else that she could possibly do in and of herself to affect the outcome of what was happening. Her current circumstance. I love what the King James, how the King James puts it in Esther 4, 16. She says, I'll just, well, I'll go into the king. And when I go to the king, which is not according to law, and if I perish, I perish. She's like, that's it. I, I, I'm, I'm done. That's it. I, I, I give up. I'm stuck. We just heard Missy and how Missy had a similar moment where she hits that moment where she says, now that I surrendered the thing that, that, that means the most to me, I can not only surrender my entire life, she goes, I can surrender my every day. I love that, my everyday life. You see, when you surrender your present circumstances and you're inviting God into your day, you're inviting God to walk with you, you're giving him free reign throughout your day, each and every day. It's a moment where you, where you get to that point where you, you turn around and all you see is a dead end and a dead end and a dead end and there's nowhere else you can go. And it says at that moment when there's nothing else, you, that's the beginning point of where surrender begins, real surrender. And God comes in at that moment and he pulls you up on his lap and says, don't worry about this, I've got it. See, the thing is, though, you don't have to wait until you've exhausted all of your possibilities. You don't have to wait until you've exhausted, until you've come to the end of your rope. Here's what it looks like. You wake up in the morning, you invite God into that day with you to walk with you. You speak with God throughout the day. You listen for God throughout the day. You watch for God throughout the day. You let him interact and guide you. You don't wait until Sunday before you invite God into your life. You do it Monday morning. And then when you walk with him like that each and every day and you're looking for God in each of these moments, God begins to shape and change your perspective and change your heart to where as you look at your present circumstance, you see your present circumstance from a different perspective. Let me give you a very practical example with this. Some of you guys know a little bit of the story, but my wife and I, we've been uh, putting wood floors in our house, right? So we've been putting these wood floors in our house for a couple years now. It's one of these projects where as the money comes in, you, you have enough to redo floors in one room. So I've done each of the bedrooms upstairs, the hallway upstairs. The entire upstairs is done with this new Pergo flooring that's really nice. Downstairs, I've got a living room. I've got the dining room. I've got the kitchen den. All I have left is the entryway, the hallway, and then a big uh, fireplace room. So about half the downstairs is done. My wife decides a few years, I didn't mean to say it like that, it sounded worse, like my wife, like Amy decided a couple weeks ago it was time to finish it. So she grabs a sledgehammer and a uh, a crowbar and goes to the tile. And and this, I think we got a picture of it right here. Yeah, so she starts in one day, she like single-handedly destroys all the tile. She takes all the tile in the entry. She does all her stuff, that's a lot of tile. And so it's one of those moments where it's like, all right, I guess we're doing that, you know. And so I, 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 she gets all that done. We clean it all up, and I go to Home Depot to get all the stuff, and, and I look up there. Every time we've gone to Home Depot for the last four years, the, 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 the flooring that we use, it's right there, the whole big piles of it. I walk over. Guess what's not there? I text her, we could be in trouble. Now, I, we could be in trouble meant I'm going to have to go straight to Pergo, to the, to the company, have them ship it straight to us, right? Now, they have discontinued the flooring completely looking around at all these different places, you know, that cell flooring, like, it's gone. Now, that's problematic when you have half a house done with this flooring. Well, perspective's a little bit different. As you can see what happened here, uh, my wife decided to make our obstacle into an opportunity. And so as we ordered new flooring for the downstairs, we took the flooring up. We're going to reuse that down in the basement, which is what we've always wanted to do. And while we're at it, why don't we take the wall out between the kitchen and the dining room and expand the kitchen to the kitchen that she's always wanted. And so I texted this picture to Aaron uh, a couple Sundays ago. I said, my wife has decided to make her obstacles into her opportunities. And he said, you just keep telling yourself that, right? (laughs) God took pain, anguish, frustration, 
irritation, heartache, and turn it into something so totally different. See, that's what actually, it is what God does when you walk with him each and every day. When you've invited him into your present circumstance, your perspective shifts. It changes. And you start seeing him show up in, in different ways. He turns the sorrow into celebration. What about you? Have you ever had that moment in your life where all of a sudden your day changed and, and all of a sudden it's, everything changed and you had to decide how you're going to look at this? What's your perspective that you're going to look at this, this circumstance, this situation? And in that moment, you have to make the decision. A job loss? Did you lose a job? You, you now have a, a pattern where you've got to go to the hospital again and again and again for treatments. Maybe you've got a, a marriage that's on the rocks. You've got a wayward child. You've got whatever it is in your life. You've had these moments in your current circumstance where you're having to choose how you look at that current circumstance. Well, the, the secret to surrender is that when you surrender your present circumstance, God will turn sorrow into celebration. Because you can, sur you can surrender your present circumstance to a faithful God. You want to know how to surrender your sorrow? S secondly, surrender your future control. Surrender your future control. Control over what's coming down the road for you. Again, Esther was at the end of her ropes when she finally came clean with the king, right? She's, she's finally hit that point where, where she just kind of lays it all out that she takes her hopes, her dreams for her, for her people, for everything, and she holds it out to the king. And in that moment, it is no longer her control. It is in the king's hands, and he has to decide what's going to happen. Missy said it like this. She said, I just assumed I was going to be sick. I, I, this is, that my life was going to... Uh, this is just the life I'm going to have to live. As you saw the, the testimony of Missy, you saw that she, it wasn't with bitter or anger. It's just, this is, this is what, evidently, God has a different plan for me than what I had planned. She just hands that over. And in that moment, you can see, you, we see her in her story, her demeanor change. Because God's starting to do something in her life in that moment. As she's looking to the future and surrendering that over to God. Surrender our future, surrendering our future is hard for many of us because we like to be in control. We have a plan, we make purposes, we have all these things. We surrender for us, you know, you want to, you know, hard, surrender your future for your kids and for your family. You know, we, we, we do all of these things, we want to control what God has for us. The other day I was speaking to a friend about one of my daughters and they're like, they're asking what they were planning on doing and, and I told them, I was like, well, I know the plans that I have for them, says their father, you know, trying to quote the scriptures a little bit out of context because the actual passage in Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. It's hard to surrender our future I've heard it said, surrendering to God like this is like when you sign over the blank check and you let God fill in the amount. You let God fill in what he wants. You invite God into your decisions to your future. You're inviting God into your decisions on how you, you lead your kids and your families and, and each of the, the plans. And you start to realize that the next best, the next great opportunity coming down the pike might not be what's best for you might not be what's best for them so now sometimes when you've surrendered your future to God sometimes you end up the queen of Persia but sometimes God enters you into a season of suffering and pain because of what he knows what's best for you surrender like that is when you take your dreams your hopes and you line you align them 100% with the things that God is passionate about and you walk with him in obedience daily. I don't know what my future holds, personally. I, I think about this all, I, I tell people, I say, uh, I've never been where I thought I would be three years from now, right? I make plans, I make, it's never been where I thought I would be. And yet all in my life up to this point, God's been faithful. And so as I look towards a future that I don't know what my future holds, I can look towards God's faithfulness. Surrender your past, surrender your future. Finally, you want to find out how to surrender your sorrows? Surrender your past experiences. 
It seems a little bit out of order. I, I know some people, you know, when you go from the present to the future and then to the past, but I actually put it in this order for a reason. Because for many of us, this is one of the hardest parts for us to do, to give up our past. Because for many of us, our past um, it controls so much of our life. Our past involves our bad decisions, involves our mistakes, involves the things that have happened to us. It's our justification for bitterness. Our past, for many people, it's our justification for unforgiveness, our justification for broken relationships. And so we like to hold on to these. The problem is for many of us, our past now defines us. It kind of taints the color of as we see our present circumstances. As we look to the future, it changes how we see these things. It's that old illustration when you have unforgiveness in your life and bitterness in your life. Where, where you, you've ever heard it, bitterness is like um, uh, eating rat poison and then staring at the rat and watching and waiting for the rat to die. It just eats you up. And that's so much of our past gets, we get, we get, hung up on that and it's holding us back and here's the thing if this is you you know it right now you may not be trying to tell yourself it's not you but it probably is you you're feeling it right there people beside you may not think it's you people behind you and in front of you don't think it's you but you know if this is where you are and you've got this and you've been hanging on to it it's right there and you know it and you've kind of quietly worn it as a badge, almost as a badge of honor, but the reality is it just weighs you down and is trying to crush you. And you have to know, if this is where you are, you have to know God is faithful to take care of that. He's faithful to redeem that. He's faithful to turn that. He's faithful to clean that. He's faithful. God's faithful. This is, there's a reason why Missy says this. Missy says that God, uh, he says, God is a God of miracles, to think of the growth of the pain and suffering that happened, that's the miracle. The biggest miracle is how he changed my heart, she said. I wouldn't change my deepest sufferings for that. See, Esther had every right to be bitter. Missy had every right to be bitter. You probably have every right to be bitter because of your past. But see, if Esther would have done that, that would have changed the color, it would have changed the outlook of all the things that God had planned and prepared for her going forward. Definition of surrender is to cease resisting, right? To submit to the authority. And so as we finish up here today, I want to leave with a question that is super easy. It's, It's a question very similar to what we had last week, maybe just a step further. What do you need to surrender What is it that you need to give over to God's authority? What do you need to stop trusting in yourself but be able to stop resisting God working in it? What is it? Did you have um, something that's going on in your life right now that it feels like your life is just starting to spiral? And you just need to hold that out and say, God, I surrender this to you. Do you have a, a future, a plan that you have for yourself that you feel like you're just running after, running after, and you can't keep up with it? And you need to surrender that and just say, God, this is yours. Did you have something happen in your life, some, a decision that you made, or something that just happened to you that has been holding you down, that has been growing inside of you of bitterness and pain, that you have to say, God, I am handing this over to you and surrender. You see, the secret to surrender is that, there, is that it holds the power to turn all the sorrow into celebration. Because God is a God who's faithful. He shows up time and time again. He makes beauty from ashes, right? He restores and he renews. He he, he pulls you up onto his lap and he says, don't worry about this, I've got this for you. For some of us, he's a loving father that you never had. He's a forgiveness that you never received. He's the justice that you need and God is also the mercy that you don't deserve. Because God is faithful. He turns sorrow, hurt, pain, disappointment into celebration. So as we sing this last song here, I'm going to have everybody stand. And as we sing this last song, we're not just going to sing it. I want us to to think through, I want us to use this as a moment of response. Where in that moment, what, what is it that you have to surrender? Is it a current circumstance? Is it something in the future that's uncertain? Is it a past that's been weighing you down? Is it the hurt? What do you need to do? 
right there where you are. You can turn it over to God. You may be kneeling. If you're online, you may be doing it right there in front of the, the screen and you just kneel down right there. Some people, first service that you need to come right here and just sit here and pray right here. What do you need to do? Take these next few minutes and, and give this back over to God. And I'll be back in just a minute. There is true joy in His freedom, so open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in, Jesus, Jesus. There is true joy in His freedom, so open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in, Jesus, Jesus. There is true joy in His freedom, just so open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in, Jesus, Jesus. There is true joy in His freedom, so open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in, Jesus. Listen for the free. Father, I thank you for the series that we've gone through, the last four weeks on how you've challenged us as we look at our current circumstances and the things that you've been, you've allowed to go into our lives and that you've allowed to come before us, these obstacles that can be turned into opportunities. God, that you've shown up again and again, that you've showed us that your presence is there even when it's, when it, when it's difficult to see. I love that throughout the story of Esther, Lord, that you, um, that, that your name is not even mentioned. It's almost like we have to look for you in this story and we discover you are all over the pages you're all over the story of Esther God you've got a plan for my life you've got a plan for our lives and for our future so we give that over to you God I pray for those of us here who are uh, this series has just really just been working on our hearts I pray that in this moment that you you show up your presence in a real powerful way as we surrender to you, God, I pray that even tomorrow morning, that as we as we get up and we invite you into our life, we invite you into our week and into the decisions that we make, God, that you just, as you speak, we listen and we walk in obedience. Take the things that you've given to us over the last four weeks here, God, and I, I pray that they walk out the door with us and into our homes and into our lives, into the workplace tomorrow morning. God, we give you all of this. We give you this time. Uh, as, a, as, a, as an offering to you. God, we pray all these things. We pray that it honors you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. If uh, over the last four weeks, God's been doing something in your life um, and you've made a commitment, uh, first of all, I want to plug this. If, if, if you're ready and you want to walk in obedience of baptism, that's coming up here in just a few weeks. We want to make sure you get an opportunity to surrender this way in baptism. Otherwise, make sure you tell someone what God's doing in your life. Talk to me, talk to Brian or Aaron or Ben or one of the other pastors here. If not, tell the person beside you because we're a family. Share what God is doing because God's doing amazing things in and through this place. See you guys next week. We'll start a new series here.